Hello, and welcome to another toy history lesson, as decided on by the latest Patreon poll. We're once again traveling far back in time. Many millions of years ago. 1984, precisely. We looked at 84 in the latest History of G.I. Joe episode, and today's video takes a look at Hasbro's other hit toy line that debuted that same year. The Transformers! More than meets the eye. It's the History of Transformers 1984 edition. Transformers weren't the only transforming toys on store shelves when they debuted in 1984. Tonka's GoBots had gotten the jump on Hasbro when it came to robots that changed into vehicles. But Hasbro was undaunted, declaring, We're going after them. Despite not being first, Hasbro was confident they were the best. While GoBots featured simplistic transformations, Hasbro's engineering was a little more intricate, using the transforming gimmick not just for fun, but as a challenge for young problem-solving minds. It's puzzling. And that engineering was thanks to Takara and their Diaclone line, which had been introduced in Japan a few years earlier. Being a big fan of a number of different properties from the 80s, I've seen my fair share of reboots that didn't exactly improve upon the original, and many fans have developed an automatic aversion to anything resembling a reboot. So it's ironic that two of the biggest toy lines of the 80s, G.I. Joe and Transformers, were both reboots themselves. <laughs> How ironic! The real American hero was a downsized reimagining of the classic 12-inch Man of Action with Kung Fu Grip. And for the 1984 Transformers, Hasbro explored Takara's car robot subline of Diaclone from 1982. Explore! Explore! And repurposed them into the Cybertronians we all know and love today. We are alive again! The brilliance behind Transformers, though, wasn't just a simplistic story of giant good robots fighting giant evil robots. It's actually a very human tale for being all about robots. The backstory is about a race of warmongering, power-hungry megalomaniacs. Decepticons. And their campaign to rule Cybertron. And conquer the universe. Against the peace-loving race of Autobots. But we're not fighters like they are. Which all took place on the planet Cybertron. Another planet? That's awesome. It wasn't just one element that made the story compelling. It was several things the sci-fi element of giant robots, as well as the social issue of how peace-loving beings deal with violent beings. That's what always appealed to me about the war between the Autobots and the Decepticons. Not just the testing of might, but the testing of grace as well. These weren't just mindless drones, they were very similar to humans. Intelligent robots that could think and feel. The Autobots strived for victory, but never at the expense of their integrity. And another element that made this faraway world seem not that different from Earth was the energy crisis. War was taking an incredible toll on Cybertron, creating issues not just for the Autobots. It's your problem too, Megatron! And so their planet drained of its resources, both Autobots and Decepticons abandoned their homeworld in search of new resources, bringing their age-old battle to our planet. <laughs> The tagline for Transformers was more than meets the eye, and it's fitting in more ways than one. Despite appearing to be highly advanced machines, in a clever twist, the Transformers are actually from the past. The distant past. The battle remained the same, just the setting had changed. Transformers had a bit more of a sense of melancholy to it than a lot of other cartoons of the time. The Autobots were outmatched, their planet was ravaged, and the heroic leader was driven by the guilt of bringing the battle to Earth. We can't stand by and watch the destruction of this beautiful planet. And unlike other shows where no one ever got shot, stabbed, or harmed, Transformers featured characters regularly being blasted. <laughs> the advantage of having characters that were technically robots instead of humans but had human traits, so it wasn't exactly like shooting a tin can. Like with G.I. Joe, each character received personalized card or box art, as well as their own unique bio on the back by Marvel comic writer Bud Budiansky. 
but there's only so much those bios could convey. So a four-issue limited series of comic books by Marvel was released beginning in May of 1984. The Transformers from Marvel Comics. And was so successful, they just kept making more. In September of 84, an animated series debuted to add to the legend, starting with the three-parter More Than Meets the Eye. Hasbro released 18 Autobots and 10 Decepticons in the first year. <laughs> Maybe we ought to wrap them up and put a little bow on them. And that's how many of them ended up for countless birthdays and Christmas that year. As compelling as the history of the War of Cybertron is, the favorite thing for most kids about this toy line was the big gimmick, transforming. <laughs> Despite being all about a race of warring robots, the purpose of the ability to transform wasn't mainly for fighting. Disguise. These weren't rock'em sock'em robots. They were intelligent, wily, clever. And it was a cerebral war too, employing subterfuge just as much as smashing. Besides, it sure beats walking. While I enjoyed the diversity of alt modes in later years, I appreciated the purity of the earth modes from the first year. Jets for the Decepticons, along with a gun and tape deck and autos for the Autobots. Let's burn rubber! While other toy lines featured vehicles that needed additional figures to be purchased to place them in, Transformers were both the vehicle and the driver. It was two toys in one. And interestingly enough, the alt mode of each character wasn't necessarily their most defining character trait. Many had special powers like superheroes or supervillains that had nothing to do with their transformation like Windcharger's magnetic power, Skywarp's teleportation, Teleport and destroy! Mirage's invisibility, and Hound's holograms. Now watch this! Who's he? Nobody! It's a hologram! For toys that had some amazing details and intricate mechanics, it was an opportunity for kids to practice some good old-fashioned imagination as well. Despite being outnumbered, the ratio worked considering the Decepticons were the better fighters and were generally bigger than the Autobots. It could have been 11 Decepts, but Shockwave was told to stay behind, despite appearing on the first episode of the cartoon. You are to stay behind! There were three jets released, commonly referred to as the Seekers. <laughs> Like with the first year of G.I. Joe, repaints were used to offset costs, so all three Seekers were exactly the same, except for color and personality changes. Modeled after the F-15 Eagle, there was Thundercracker, Skywarp, and Starscream. Proof that Megatron adhered to the old adage of keep your friends close and your enemies closer. The Autobots would have lost eons ago if I'd been calling the shots. Then there was Soundwave and his tape army. Eject. 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 A big jet transforming into a giant robot wasn't much of a stretch, but having a little tape deck turn into a towering titan required a little something to have it all make sense. Use your imagination. That's where mass shifting comes in. That's a Transformer's ability to change in size, or mass, from one mode to another. It allows someone like Soundwave to be a massive, imposing metal monolith, and also be a tiny tape recorder that can slip into enemy territory undetected. Hmm. I wonder who left this here? And that was one of my favorite aspects of Transformers. Espionage. It wasn't just about blasting and explosions, there was stealth involved too. Disguise. Kids could play practical jokes on their parents by using their transformers to stand in for everyday looking household items. Oh, I am so tired. I just want to read my newspaper and listen to some music on my cassette player. Ah, no, nothing but bad news again. Ah. Time for some tunes! What the hey? It's not working! Oh, there's a cassette in it! Power knob is working! It's got a volume knob that works! See, we got batteries in it! 
Oh, what is wrong with this stupid thing? I'll show you. Walter P38, where's my Schofield? Alvin! Soundwave was a great example of the attention to detail Takara put into the designs as well. A working ejector for microcassettes and a battery compartment with batteries that transform into his weapons. Soundwave helped even the odds on the battlefield all by himself with his five tape minions. There was Buzzsaw, the Condor, that was included with Soundwave, along with a pair of two-packs, Frenzy and Laserbeak. Laserbeak, the devil's light. And Rumble and Ravage. Look out! There were a few miscommunications between the toy people and the cartoon people, the biggest of which being the Rumble and Frenzy mix-up. The colors got inverted in the show, making Rumble purple and Frenzy red and black. They were pretty similar in attitude though, so it wasn't that big a deal. And rounding out the Decepticons was the leader, another master of mass shifting, the mighty Megatron who could transform into a Walther P-38 handgun with scope, silencer, and stock. Transform! <laughs> now this is one they sure don't make like they used to, because it's illegal now. It was a real sign of the times that kids could run around with this handgun, chrome finish, and no orange tip, and no one batted an eye. How times have changed. And then there were the Autobots. 18 were released at three different price points. For the families on a tighter budget, there were six Minibots released, who may have been the smallest of the first year Autobots, but they had the biggest personalities. While the larger Autobots had accurate looking car modes, the Minibots had a super deformed look. Cliff Jumper, the Porsche 924 Turbo, packed a big punch despite his small stature. <laughs> Braun, the Land Rover, was one of the strongest Autobots, despite his size. Prepare for a very large headache! Gears, the pickup truck, wasn't exactly ecstatic to take part in this video. Every time I get set to lube my cable relay, something happens. Huffer, the terminal tractor, wasn't all that pleased about taking part either. Just a waste of time and energy, if you ask me. Ah, uh, put a sock in it, Huffer. Windcharger, the Pontiac Firebird Trans Am, was always ready for some fun with the Decepticons. Remind me to discuss your definition of fun sometime. And Bumblebee, the Volkswagen Beetle, used his small stature to his advantage. And since I'm the smallest, I have the best chance of getting through. The midsize price point for the Autobots included 11 vehicles based on some of the coolest cars of the era and felt like miniature model cars, not just because of the great amount of detail, but the die-cast parts used as well. There was the Lamborghini Countach. Side swipe! Along with his brother, who thought his robot mode was even more gorgeous than his Countach mode. I'm transforming! I see my true beauty emerging! A Lancia Stratos Turbo. Wheeljack! Jazz, the Martini Racing Porsche 935 with an affinity for loud tunes. Maybe I better wind down my woofers. Blue Streak, the Datsun 280ZX, or Nissan Fairlady Z, and Autobot Chef. <laughs> that oughta cook that tin foil turkey. Mirage, the Formula One race car, who didn't exactly blend in on city roads, so he had an added talent of being able to disappear. And some Autobots built for toughness over speed. The Joe's favorite Autobot, Hound, a military Jeep with a talent for tracking down decepts. Just turn me loose, Prime, I'll sniff them out. The rambunctious Nissan Vanette, Ironhide. I need action or I'll rust out. And the Toyota Hilux 4x4, Trailbreaker. Let's try a little force field. Enough with the force fields already. Man, every time I bring this guy out, he's got to turn on one of these force fields. And a couple of emergency vehicles, which were also straight repaints, except for the light bar added on top. Talk about spare parts. The Vanette mold was used again for Ratchet, the Autobot dock, 
Repairs, repairs, repairs. And the Datsun mold was used again for Prowl, who helped the Autobots get out of speeding tickets. I'll provide an escort to get them there faster. And the biggest and most expensive Autobot for 1984 was the Commander, the king of the road, the Freightliner FL86 cab over engine truck, Optimus Prime. Let's roll. <laughs> who included a trailer that opened up into a command center and roller, a, um, uh... What's that? I'd call it a target! I did an in-depth feature on G1 Optimus Prime and why he's my ultimate hero, so if you haven't seen that already, be sure to check it out, or feel free to give it a rewatch. Despite being released well after GoBots, the Transformers had astronomical sales that lasted for several years. Let's just say we're onto something that looks like a winner. And not only became one of the most successful toy lines of all time, but one of the most profitable movie series as well under the direction of Michael Bay. Whether you think the Bay movies are true to the tone of the 80s Transformers is debatable, but no one can argue that the interest that the movies have brought to the franchise has been responsible for a massive resurgence in all sorts of new toys, games, apparel, and even a wide variety of unofficial third-party offerings, many of them updates of the classic original Transformers released in 1984. And regardless of what you think of Michael Bay and his Transformers movies, that's an optimist way of looking at things. There's usually some good that comes out of everything. And that's the history of Transformers 1984 edition. Want to share some of your vintage G1 memories? Scroll down and go to town. If you enjoy my channel and want to show your support, consider joining the Patreon tribe. All sorts of different rewards for different contributor levels and exclusive videos, like this week's look at my favorite G1 Optimus reissue, the 2002 Takara New Year Convoy. And a heads up about my other presences online with more vintage toy reverence. My Twitter is at Michael Mercy. Instagram is at the Michael Mercy, and Facebook page is facebook.com slash Michael Mercy. Thanks for watching, and until the history of Transformers 1985 edition, transform and roll out!